This is a Bulldog Radio Podcast. It's Season 3, Episode 63 of the MVSP. It's a beautiful day in Big Rapids, and we got a great show on the docket for you today. Some Fair State Sports Report coming in with women's golf in action, track and field, softball, the whole lot, as well as a little bit of talk about Miggy chasing 3,000, which is an awesome time, and especially last night and the theatrics I had to go down for him to not make it there and everything. We'll kind of debate, debate about that, maybe some other stuff if time permitting. But Brandon, before we get into, into it, how are you doing? I'm doing very solid, and I have a beef with the Yankees like everybody else does, but obviously we'll get into that in here in just a minute. Yankees suck. But, I mean, I will say one thing. Campus has got a little bit of light so far this morning because, I mean, we got football back just I for know. today. So. Campus is kind of hopping a little bit. I've kind of noticed that a little bit more. Yeah. Now that it's kind of gotten nicer out, people are taking the bird scooters around, people yeah. on their bikes a little bit. We're starting to get the, the sense of summer coming. Started in. with a jacket yesterday, I had to drop it, and I went short sleeves because it was like 60. It is good when you only have... It is a, such a good feeling when you're in Michigan when you can leave the house without a sweatshirt. Like, you're just like, yeah, I don't need a sweatshirt. Like, those are just like the peak times. It's a nice of day like, when that happens. Oh, this is, this is wonderful, but... I'm hoping that it stays here, though, because I know it was supposed to get cold um, over the next week or so. But I don't know how cold, because obviously you can only prepare so much in at hand when it comes to that meteorology. That is true. So that is true. Take that with a grain of salt, but we have so much on deck for the show today. Let's get right into it. Joe, where do we start first? Why don't we shoot around over to Women's Golf GLIAC Championship this weekend? Yeah, big Big matchup coming for the Bulldogs in the GLIAC tournament. Uh, men played last week. The women will now have their turn at Augusta Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So they will be teeing off today um, in the opening round to hopefully make the medal match. Um, and, I mean, really match the the boys' success and maybe even one up and try to bring home a chip. But a lot of good competition ahead. But they've been playing very solid as of late. I mean, the Cav Classic certainly had a little bit of its challenges, especially with the weather. But... I mean, you still have a lot to look forward ahead of you, and there's certainly a lot to in store for the Bulldogs this weekend. And on the bright side, too, it was, it was really nice out this week, so they're able to get out onto the course. Uh, it was a little bit windy uh, these past couple of days and yes. for conditions and stuff, and I think it might be a little bit more windy uh, today out on the course uh, for them. But I think it'll still be a interesting challenge. They've been showing constant improvement all throughout the season so i think they could really surprise some people with how far they're going to go in this uh tournament here i think they got a really good chance of making the uh making the semifinals as well kind of getting past the cut and making the kind of play-in stage but it's just going to come down to this first day how well they're going to be able to do that uh you know they kind of were like the men where they Played pretty solid, and they improved on the second day almost every time. So we'll see how that goes. They just got to start off hot and try to ride that wave a little bit. But it'll be interesting to see, especially since it's going to be going to be windy, going to be a little bit cold. It's like, what, 45 out today. So play, playing conditions aren't the greatest. However, they're going to be outside, and they're going to be playing for a chip. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of pseudo cold this morning. Like, I mean, I went out on I wore my shorts, but I had to wear a sweater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I was out, I was out for my run this morning, and I wore sweatpants, and I was kind of getting hot on over the back half of my run. But I mean, it was still kind of like the breeze was enough to you're like, ooh, it's a little chilly. But uh, a little so, chilly. But a little bit. I mean, the weather overall. I mean, it should be pretty nice this weekend. Um, I mean, in Ohio, it seemed like it was pretty solid last weekend. Obviously, a little windy, but. Um, there was a lot that we could look in store from that from that Cav Classic. I mean, we kind of got to see like how the standings are played out as of now. Um, we had a couple teams finish ahead of the Bulldogs, including GV, Wayne State, Northwood, uh, and Saginaw. But I mean, that's four teams right there. So you can hypothetically put yourself in the fifth spot. But obviously, there's going to be other teams that are going to be um, in that contention as well in the for conference. Sure. Because I mean, there's always going to be teams that are going to step up. And I mean, you kind of got to plan for that. Um, overall because, I mean, Northwood's also a very solid team, um, Ashland as well. So you look at some of those teams as well that you know are going to be there. Uh, and But you know you still have the ability um, to make a good run at this. And, I mean, we've had a lot of success across the board. And I think with overall the team all together, um, we've seen, like, a lot to step up, not only on the, the men's side and the women's side too. Like, Elaine Aldred has been awesome. But seeing like Hope Thibo step up and have some great great rounds overall, uh, and Abby Gravel as well. Um, seeing a lot of those other younger um, 
under our underclassmen stepping up and shooting those big rounds too to help boost the team score is huge. And that's going to be well needed this weekend because, I mean, there's a lot of great individual golfers in this conference, but what sets you apart is when you have four or five of them have a good day all on the same day. And that's, that's what's going to be when it needs to happen uh, in order to bring home the GLIAC chip. For sure. Yeah. I think That's like the tough part about it too is because like not everybody plays super great and win. Not everybody plays super great when it's cold. Each player has like their – certain preferences that they like to play as well as like the type of conditions that may that bring the best out of them so especially with these not ideal conditions it's going to be interesting but it's just going to be down to the teams who show the resiliency and kind of take it with a grain of salt take it off the chin and go to play i guess yeah hit gotta hit the sweet the you the gotta sweet hit, spot hit the sweet spot keep the face solid and square uh, good swing path. Don't do what i do Hook went it straight golfing. right <laughs> went out golfing yesterday for the first time did you really what'd you shoot uh, I shot like a fifty something. Oh, yeah, I, I don't really keep track after I like triple bogeyed. <laughs> that's but great. like first time out, not too bad. Driver was a little bit squirrely, but other than that, short game was kind of dialed. Not gonna lie. Ooh, that's pretty good. Driver I got was really wet on the course. Yeah, I believe it. I got to get out of the range and start swinging again. Yeah. Uh, but the scary part is Khaki's range isn't open yet. Yeah, I know, which is sucks because I don't, like you can go play on the course, but I like, work on my stinger. I want to work on my swing before I go out and play around. Like exactly. I gotta, gotta, I gotta get, I gotta get the rust off, man. I gotta work on, I gotta work on those, those good, those big iron shots. That's something I need to work on. But yeah. I, I also saw yesterday, um, in a video that the, sorry, this is off topic, but uh, Rick Shields Golf, you know who that is I do on know YouTube. Who that is. Yeah, I saw that there's a video of like illegal clubs. There was he had a wedge that had no grooves. Like it was just a flat face. Like so, every single oh, yeah, time you hit video. it, it was a spin. It would spin, and then he had another one that had sandpaper as grooves. So then it would literally like absolutely just stop and spin backwards on one bounce. I was like, could you just imagine if we like let collegiate and pro players use clubs Can like just that for a tournament? Just yeah. let people use illegal clubs, dude. That would just be insane. There's even like that self driver. Like you literally don't even have to swing. It's so spring powered. It can hit at 200 yards. By just a simple like knocking spring, and it just goes two hundred yards. You put on like a straight. you put like a twenty two caliber bullet in there, pretty and much. It just like shoots the shoots the face out. Yeah, it's just so weird. Kind of sick, not gonna lie. Yeah, do we do would they make a tournament where you just use illegal, use illegal clubs, clubs all the time? That would honestly be interesting. It would be kind of sick. I'm use, not gonna lie. Because I would love to see who would thrive. In that kind of an environment. Well, because then you'd have to practice and stuff like that with like those illegal clubs. Exactly. I don't know if they'd want to do so much. Yeah, it makes it a whole new element of the game. Very There's a guy I saw, uh, he like uh, welded a whole bunch of chain together to make the, like the shaft. Oh, yes. And he, like, I have seen that as well. Jerry rigged uh, like a five iron face on there and he went to go swing it and it was like a 10 pound club or something yes. like that. Jimmy rig. What a great word. Jimmy rig. Uh, anyway, moving on into the first stage sports report. Um, tennis is in action this weekend. Uh, some big games coming up. Uh, they're going to be taking on the, the women will be taking on Saginaw Valley, um, and I believe the men are off this weekend. Yep, so, men are off. So um, just the women's in action. Uh, the finale um, for against Saginaw Valley. Of course, the court dedication for uh, former coach Eddie Luck. Um, for at twelve thirty to kick off the one o'clock match. Um, should be really good. I mean, Saginaw's are a, a, a solid team. Um, definitely, I think going in that there's going to be some confidence that we can go up and beat them. Um, but obviously we gotta, we gotta show up and we gotta make sure that we play our best, um, today as well. So, um, that's going to be coming, that's going to be playing right as we're probably releasing this episode. So probably. if you're right now in that situation, get on over to the racket center, go watch some tennis. Trust me. It is a lot more enjoyable Pretty than people, some people say it is. I will say that 1000%. It was very entertaining, but uh, I mean, right now we're in an interesting spot. I mean, especially in the GLIAC standing so far this season, where I mean we have Saginaw, that we know that we can we're capable of beating this team. There's no question about it. Um, and we're definitely in a position now where we're kind of there's we we can't really like jump up any place because right now Wayne GV and Northwood are all two games ahead of us at least on uh, with seven oh six one conference records. We're at four and three right now. But I mean, you get Lake State and Michigan or Michigan Tech uh, right on our tails, so we'll have to take this one to make sure that we lock in that top four seeding, because um, that'll be that'll be crucial going into the tournament, um, especially the fact that there are I believe nine teams. So uh, I don't actually know how the bracket would work for that. Are they only taking top it hasn't, eight? It hasn't been released. Or do yet. they just play an eight think, versus nine? They're probably going to gonna do the like one. they'll probably will. They'll, I don't know if they're going to do like a one versus nine or whatever it is. Yeah. But we'll. 
I feel like that's probably what they're gonna do. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna investigate right here. Uh, so the women's tournament is says that it's um, it, the round one. Actually, no, it's only six. So that's even more important. So if we get into, we're gonna be pretty much solidified in the four spot, um, to take on um the five, which at this moment of time is Lake State. But then again, we would see what Michigan Tech does, especially if they play this weekend potentially flip-flopping into that five spot, which would make a whole different matchup. And then the three will face the six, um, and then the number one and number two overall seeds will get a bye. So yeah. that's going to be interesting going into the um, with Northwood and uh, Grand Valley right now. They're fighting for potentially a, a bye right now with the same record. Um, Northwood has two more victories, but one more loss. That gives GV the edge and win percentage just barely. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's gonna be it's gonna be huge this weekend. I mean, we're coming off of a couple a, a, lo- a tough weekend last week um, against some really good, really good teams, Northwood and Wayne State. Uh, obviously, got kicked in the teeth a little bit. How yeah. are you gonna respond, right? On the Fight bright back. side, though. Oh, sorry to cut you off. But on the bright side, though, we played at Northwood, so we got a feel for their courts and stuff. So like that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. However, yeah, it did get swept, but regardless, it was still pretty solid. And I think today we're gonna play pretty well. As- too. I mean, we're back home after a what four or five week, uh, yeah, four three week, no four week, four week by our away stand. Mm-hmm. So I think we'll be doing pretty solid. Yeah, fight back, soundtrack, bounce back, redemption. That's really all that it comes in, and that's especially well needed, um, going into a tough Gliac tournament coming up ahead. But uh, it's gonna be a good matchup. I mean, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they do. Uh, we wish them the best of luck, um, and we hope to see them get two Ws, uh, or I should say one W, uh, today against the Cardinals going into this week. So very, very cool stuff. Uh, track and field will be in action, me and my crew uh, going down to enemy yes, territory sir. in Allendale for the Al Owens Classic. Should be a really good meet. This year it's going to be very interesting uh, because um, there's actually reports coming around um, that have been confirmed that the Hillsdale Gina Relay is, is canceled for next week which has now uh, changed a lot of team schedules that normally go to that meet. So now there's actually a bigger loaded distance field coming into Al Owens as compared to years past due to the lack of races at the Gina Relays. Um, So that's going to make it very interesting to see tomorrow just because the meet size is overall going to be bigger and faster than it was in years past where normally it's been pretty loaded um, in mid distance down as far as sprints and mid distance or events, not as much distance races altogether. Um, but now we're going to see a lot more um, overall just um, diverse quality um, of competition. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we got a whole pack of dogs in the 5K. Should be a really fun, uh, a really fun race. Uh, I believe there's going to be two heats, but we'll have plenty of dogs in each of them, especially uh, in the 1500 as well. Uh, it's going to be very fun. We're going to have a lot of great performances. The throws are, have already went down there this morning. Um, some of our guys got to see uh, Coach Larry and the, the crew head off before they uh, make the travel down to Grand Rapids. So uh, it's going to be fun. I'm really looking forward to the meet. Uh, hopefully, well, I mean, right now it looks like it's supposed to be like 80 degrees, which is going to probably be be a little like i almost want to say too warm um but i think overall i know for me racing at 11 that that's going to be nice to have a little bit on the cooler side but i think it's still going to be a really solid meet overall it always is uh and it's been going to be even better compared to now as uh, the meet schedule has obviously changed so i'm going to bring on a lot of new competition a lot of new faces and hopefully a lot more fast times in years past true and gv is going to be there or it's at GV, so sure, always lights that fire underneath too. Always, yeah. Which we we'll chase the Lakers. I mean, we can get there eventually. Uh, I hope so. Uh, it's gonna be fun. Uh, looking forward to that. You can follow that along online on the live results. Um, I believe on GV's website they have all the information and more on there if you want more. So should be a really good event. Uh, finally, well, almost finally, wrapping out the Fair State Sports Report. Softball is going to be on the road this weekend. I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to be heading out today at some point, um, going down to face Purdue and Wisconsin Parkside on Saturday and Sunday into a pair of doubleheaders. Um, not the not the ideal results we wanted to see. Um, on obviously on Wednesday and Thursday, um, some tough losses against a good Northwood team and obviously rival GV. Um, but I mean, we had, we had so many spurts. I know me and Joe were there, especially for the duration of the Northwood game. There was times where we had some key opportunities and it's just been like, 
we've just had really bad luck of not being able to get runners across the plate in scoring position because, I mean, we've put ourselves in position plenty of times mm-hmm. where we had opportunities to score. Uh, there were just times we just could not get the runners across. And really, like, yeah. that's that's really the only thing that has been keeping us from being a high-quality conference team, like, in the standings-wise because, like, we're obviously, like, in the situation of how talented this team is, there's no doubt in my mind that we can be in the middle of the pack for sure uh, mm-hmm. of this conference, even top tier. Um, we just haven't been able to get the the perfect as overall. Like we've seen really good pitching performances, but they've been in spurts. And obviously, the staff is still um, a little banged up with injuries, and that's totally understandable. Uh, but just pairing that with a day that we can put across a lot of runs, that's yeah. really the difference from us being. Uh, a potential 15 to 20 win team compared to where we're sitting right now. That's really the only difference because this team is definitely better than the record shows. Yeah, because we're crazy fast. Like, we just got to put the ball in play and we'll beat it out most of the time. Like, that's what happened uh, against Northwood. Like, we beat out a couple throws. I will say this, umpires, strike zone, a little garbage a little sketchy, against Northwood. Yeah. A little garbage, not going to lie. Uh, but, I mean, when that happens, though, it's like – that's the crappy part, right? It's because when that starts to happen, like, as a hitter, it's like, well, then I have to just swing at everything. Mm-hmm. And then it's so inconsistent that, like, the ones that you don't, that you are like, I'm not going to swing at this because it's not a good pitch. And then he calls it a strike. And then when you're just trying to foul it off, you put it in play and you don't get a good swing on it, which is unfortunate. And I think, like, especially when you have that going, it just shows a little bit of adversity that they got to overcome. It's a tough one to overcome as well. So, like, you can't really knock them for it. But, like, still, it, that's just the tough part is when you have – bad umpires who don't really know what they're doing behind the plate and like yeah. you can't really do much but i mean pretty northwest coming up in wisconsin parkside it's gonna be a solid little road trip for this weekend so yeah it was it was tough to watch some of those calls come across and obviously uh, i know i've been a big proponent on the the show of like great teams overcome those things um but it's it's super tough when you have a situation of it's one thing when they have a different zone right Every yeah. every umpire is a different zone. I mean, one can be top kneecaps, one can be bottom, one can be letters, one can be belt. It like it it varies on the umpire. But yeah. when you have inconsistencies, that's where it really becomes like if you're gonna call mid shin as a strike, like keep yeah, that, it's, it sucks, up, but keep it there, right? That's because then you're gonna be looking low pitch, yeah. and then you're gonna always... have the green light on that. But when you definitely see those pitches come across, and every other is a different call, now you have the question of oh my gosh, what am I going to do if it's going to be coming in shin level? Am I going to swing? Like, that's not the primary pitch. Yeah, it's almost like you're giving a choice to, uh, like, a questionable pitch where if I'm in the box, it's like, I don't want to question. If I have to swing, I have to swing. But if I have to question myself because they're questioning that, that zone itself, then it becomes even harder. And that's the problem. Like, just be consistent with that. Uh, we didn't see that much consistency. And I'm not saying like that, so that cost us the game quite for sure. But I mean, having those having those things makes it so much more difficult. And when you have a, a team that like hitting wise has just has been up and down as of recently, that just that just adds to it. Right. That just makes it even more difficult to try to get that consistency dialed in. And that's just something that's going to that's just really tough to go into yeah. knowing you're going to have some of those things kind of happen. So it's just it's just hard when you have a lot of those those other elements that you you don't need to worry about. Yeah, that you don't have to worry about. It just makes games harder. The, there's one girl from uh, Northwood. I think her name was Brittany Steimel, I think smoked a home run. Oh, yeah. That thing was launched. Yeah. Dead center the into the wind by the flagpole. That thing was smoked. Yeah, and that correct me if I'm wrong. That was the very pitch after um, the exchange between uh, one of the coaches and the umpire yeah. about the strike zone. Yeah, that was kind of tough. Yeah, because there was like a pitch that was like right down the middle that he called the ball. Yeah, right? yeah. And then that didn't that walk them on to get like two people on. I can't remember, but all I I remember that ex- there was like an exchange going on. We were trying to figure out what was going on, and then the very next pitch was just. Smoke. nuclear missile all the yeah. way over top the center field fence. And we have the biggest field in the GLIAC, too. So yeah, that's, that's a bomb. You know, you're putting some juice behind that one. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though. I was filming. Like, I was, like, doing, like, recording and stuff. You might may or may not have heard me chirping the umpire a couple times. <laughs> I don't know. Me and Brandon were sitting there. And, like, <laughs> there would be times where I'm filming, and, like, the ball would go, and I'd see it, like, below their knees, and he'd call it a strike. And I'm just like, mm. 
Don't uh-uh. think like you gotta get your eyes checked there, big uh-uh. dog. No, yeah, it, it's tough when you have to overcome those things. And we got both angles too. We were down on the the first base side uh, watching, and yeah, I was with you videoing, uh, helping out. As obviously it was too cold uh, in that moment of time, and then also in the press box up top. So we got multiple angles of yeah some questionable calls, and obviously both teams knew it into that game yeah. that it was not good. So it is what it is. What do you do now? You gotta bounce back. That's you got true. Prime opportunities this weekend against Purdue, Northwest, and Wisconsin Park side um, for both those games Saturday and Sunday. Uh, hopefully, you can see those online and follow them on the the game day uh, stats and live live action. I believe it's well. I think it'll still be on there. Yeah. That'll be. Are, you, they, are they only broadcasting home games? You know? I believe the all, nine and ten is only broadcasting home oh, games. So you just gotta watch the live stats then. Yeah, exactly. So because I was I was gonna say you can watch it online. And, few and on my sports now but you can't because it's not a home game. we have but two you, more three three more home games yes that's at the end of the year and correct me if i'm wrong they're like three straight days in a row 29 30 and one yeah friday saturday april 29 april Sunday. 30 may 1 wow look at that a whole slew of what a weekend games. we're gonna have that Woo! that time friday saturday and sunday back to back to bank so mark your calendar for next week Catch some softball before exam week. So there you go. Uh, Rallying out the Fair State Sports Report. Football. Back on the gridiron. Spring game is today. Crimson and Gold are going to be facing off at, I believe it's tab at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock? Yeah. 3 o'clock. I got to be there on 2.30. At 2.30. I will be watching online. Um, and it should be a really good game overall. I know um, they announced the honorary coaches, um, all Bulldog alums Scott Fish and Jeff Schmitz will be at the helm of both the red and the white teams for the crimson and gold spring game. Why that makes sense, I don't know. Um, But, I mean, it's going to be super fun just to see uh, a team back on the gridiron that won a national championship only Mm -hmm. five months ago. So, I mean, it's going to be a super fun event. Uh, I know there's some things actually going on before the game as well that are put on by... I don't know if it's like the the rack or uh, student services or something. I heard there's like carnival things, inflatables going on before the game. I'm not exactly sure what that's all about, but this thing's a whole event, right? We got yeah. the ring ceremony. Um, we're going to have the spring game sick, stuff dude. at halftime, and it's all free. And you can come watch, and you can, I think, actually be able to take photos with the trophy. I think it's something I read on there as well. So if I'm you want a picture with the Natty, I'm trying to get there early so I can get a picture. You with might want to go head on over there to get a picture with that national championship trophy. That's true. So, That's true. Um, oh yeah, here it is, right here. So Entertainment Unlimited um, it has some special promotional activities, including football toss, inflatable tug of war, an obstacle course, and wait for it, every college fan's favorite, free food. So Dude, there you go. Go get on, on over out there. there. Tailgate a little bit before you go. Have some fun. Then go and watch a great football game. It's gonna be a blast. I Man. mean, you're watching a you're watching a team that's trying to repeat next year. I think we got a good chance to repeat, especially with seeing that we'll be able to open up our offensive scheme a little bit with Malik probably taking the helm. I think with kind of Evan taking that uh, second string spot again. Uh, cause like Malik when when he got the go ahead and when he got the green light, he was slinging it. Mm-hmm. And I think when you look at that, I mean, this team also averaged 52 points in the playoffs. Which is ridiculous, like that, like that's just, <laughs> that's just insane. <laughs> like fifty-two points in the playoffs, like against like the best, uh, and you score almost a sixty burger on the on Valdosta State, a team that was pro- like projected to like hang with us that whole time. It's crazy, but this team is going to be insane next year, and it's going to be really cool to see them in action again. I've missed football a lot. Especially, I've also just missed being in the press box up on the third floor. Like that's yeah. one thing I miss a lot too. So it's going to be good to get back into it and kind of. Get a little, get a little precursor for what the fall is going to bring us. Yeah, I, it's one thing to score a fifty burger, but a fifty burger with extra mayonnaise. Well, here's the thing: a fifty insert a, special a, sauce. A fifty burger almost in the first half. Yeah, like that's insane. Sheesh. Forty-one in the effort. We could have put so much more on if we really wanted to. I we feel could, like we probably could have set the record. Oh, we could have, but I think the biggest thing to watch. Uh, obviously, we're going to be seeing how this team will compare to last year's team. Um, just to see personnel-wise depth chart, who's going to be playing more, um, especially you're now going to have to fill some holes with guys that have declared for the draft or have graduated. I think the biggest thing I'm going to be looking forward to, especially um, looking at both sides, is overall, uh, especially on the offensive side, we're going to see now 
how the playbook changes with Malik compared to Bernhardt because obviously yeah. the first thing you'd see it's on be paper a very much heavy. Oh, I don't know if we're going to be probably, as heavy of a run. Yes, I mean, exactly. We still, got, we still got Jeremy. We still got uh, who is our second, third string running back. Uh, Carson Clark. Yeah, we're still mm-hmm. have him. So we'll have a very strong and present run game, which is going to be good. But I think now, and that's the one thing too, is like we won't, probably won't have to worry about Malik getting injured as much because we're not going to really do that RPO or that run option that we usually do, uh, that we did with Jared. And I think that's the one reason why he got hurt for those first couple, and he was, or for those first couple weeks, and then he was nursing that kind of throughout the whole season. It's like we just, that was what we were, that's what we did every time. It was either a handoff to Tyler or Jared just ran it. And that was mm-hmm. great. Like, that's the one thing about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you do take that with a grain of salt, though, too, because I mean, he had he hadn't played football in four or five years. No, yeah, so being I mean, able he to did it. He did it incredibly. He did it incredibly well. Too. Like that was insane. Yeah, yeah, but, like, yeah. But I, 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 I totally agree. We'll with see. What a, you're we'll saying, see a little so. bit more longevity. I yeah, think, exactly. With and the I mean, it's, on the offensive side. Yeah, especially the. I mean, all, overall, we are losing a couple offensive linemen, but no one's worried because we had two units that were going out there every single game that we're showing out. Yeah. And, like we literally did full, we did full like a line change. Yeah. Basically. Literally line changes. Like it was not even hockey season. We were talking about line changes and football. And that just shows you how good this team really was. But I mean, obviously the, the offensive scheme change will be one to watch offensively, uh, defensively for sure. I'm uh, going to be seeing how um, the pass rush and overall front seven are going to look. We lo- losing some veteran guys, some, some leaders on that side of the uh, leaders on that side of the ball. Uh, but, I mean, really bringing a lot of guys back, a lot of young guys that got some playing time later on in the season as well. So being able to see how they step in as well is going to be really cool. Uh, but it's going to be fun. 3 o'clock, top tagger. Football's back, baby. It is back. Just for now, just a little sliver. Just a little uh, taste. Just a little sliver for the fall. Uh, you can get that and all. You can watch online as well. I believe My Sports Now has it online. Um, to watch the live stream as well as Rob and Sandy on the call. That's what I'll, I'll be listening to. Uh, maybe I'll be texting Joe in between quarters. Um, he'll be up in the box eating some nice Buffalo Wild Wings, doing some statistics. Little statistical I'll be on socials today. Oh, socials today? Yep. Oh, I'm going to be following on Twitter. Really, then. I don't think we're doing a whole bunch of uh, stats seeing that it's a spring game, but I think I, th- I think we only have like But what four if Malik throws working. for 1,000 yards? we got to have that I recorded. I think it's unofficial. <laughs> it's unofficial. Yeah, I guess it is. It's only the spring game. But I'd be interested to see how those guys do. I'm going to be really interested to see the running back battle as well because, like, having guys like Jeremy Burrell and Carson. Like, Carson Clark's a really good back as well. Like, he impressed me a lot at the end of games for how many yards he was able to churn up after contact and through, uh, through each hole. But I think the the thing that will make it very interesting is to see who they pair which back with if Malik – is going to be with Jeremy on one side, or are they going to split them up and put Carson with Malik on one side, and then you could have uh, Evan and Jeremy on the other or whatever. It'd be really interesting to see how that works out, but mm-hmm. uh, we'll have to find out. 3 o'clock, making sure all the th- everything will be covered uh, online as well. So make sure to follow that all along. FairStateBulldogs.com. Dot com. Dot com. But... It's Try good. to do my best Rob Bentley impression. The Rob Bentley that. impression. He's Gracie got Bulldogs.com. Yes, he does. He's got a great voice. Him he's and Sandy. That, he's got that iconic. Exquisite. Yeah. Absolutely exquisite. They ma- they make it look so easy. Me and Joe are trying to get there, but we're just not that we're just not there yet. Uh, Which is a, fine. We'll get a, there. That's a thing too. Like when I would like listen to uh like the ESPN broadcast and when I would listen to uh what was it? Like ESPN broadcast when I played Shepard and then the ESPN broadcast of the national championship was like I still prefer Robin Sandy. I I'm do. It is like it might be a little bit less like of a of a production or whatever, but like some about some about Robin Sandy just just going back and forth. Yeah, I I definitely feel like the local touch definitely has a little bit to do it, but I think it's just so such a unique like that it's such a unique combo as far as like I mean Rob does a great job of bringing you the those just those golden calls right you watch the highlights back the X-Man. and you, touchdown bulldogs you know you always yeah. get those and you always get you in your feelings and then obviously you have the great insight from sandy as well that just like you would you always have like the analysis of the game itself but there's so much more that like sandy brings on the outside of the game like itself like you're Dude, not, I love listening to Sandy, especially like yeah. when there's a big play. Who's like, oh my gosh! Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but like the like one, I guess the point I'm trying to make is like a lot of the analysts on broadcast teams go strictly into the numbers, what 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 you're seeing just directly on the field. Where like Sandy's looking at the crowd, the coaches, 
like getting the whole environment involved, making it almost feel like you ha- you have not only a feel of the game, but the whole aspect of the game together with the environment. And that's what I really appreciate about it. Like getting, haven't seen the crowd on their feet uh, and being able to see the coaches interact, um, and even especially with officials sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's certainly just a fun aspect. They're a great team, and it's honestly a blessing to listen to them. And I would agree, though. There's there. I definitely would prefer those guys as opposed to some of the guys we've not saying that they were bad, but they just bring the, a whole level of energy and excitement yeah. and just overall everything. Our whole broadcast team does. Harrison and Scott did a great job in hockey as well. We got a really good group of broadcasters here. I mean, it's That's really true. really good to really appreciative to be able to learn from them, being able to um, being able to experience that. So really really cool stuff. But that's the extended Fair State Sports Report. When we come back. Did the Yankees just solidify themselves as the most hatred fan base in all of sports? We'll have the answer. Stay right here. When Brandon and I first started our podcast, we didn't know really what to do. Bulldog Radio helped us out, but the one big thing that really made us really go to the next level was Anchor.fm. If you want to start your own podcast, go through Anchor.fm. They make it so easy. They make it a one-stop shop for you to record, edit, and publish your podcast. And not only that, they publish it to a whole bunch of different platforms for you to go on. I mean, we've talked about it. You got CastBox, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, just to name a few. So if you guys want to start your own podcast, go on Anchor.fm. You can make your own account, start editing, start recording, and start publishing your podcast today. We're back, second half of the show, Major League Baseball on the docket, and for many Tigers fans, obviously, chasing Miguel Cabrera's milestone that was almost achieved last night. I was recording this on Friday, April 22nd, until this man, the Yankee skipper, what the heck, Mr. Man? Boone himself, Boone, what you doing? Decides to walk Miguel Cabrera to, to low the bases and eventually give Austin Meadows a two-run single to give the Tigers Karma. the win. That's what the Tigers Instagram post is. Karma. Like, Karma, baby. Did you see the the one post that they made? Um Please walk, don't run to the game today or whatever it was. That's after. funny. Uh, ha, ha. That is a straight shot and what you deserve. The uh, Yankees LOL. have the worst or will be probably the most hated franchise in sports altogether. And that's considering Stephen A and his rants against the Cowboys. I don't know. I I'll tell you what. Let me let me tell you. Let me let me enlighten you real quick. Spill. I guess. I just like I don't know. I feel like since so early on in the season, what is this game gonna matter if you win or lose this game? Like there's you have so many opportunities to make it up. And when a guy, especially in front of the home crowd, is trying to break a break a a milestone that so that only a few players have reached and for him to make history as well as maybe getting the win for his team in doing so, just pitch him pitch it to him. Guy was over three going into it. Like, yeah, you might say he was due for one, but like Statistically, you probably could have gotten him out, but just pitch to the guy, especially with everything that's going on. Like he's chasing three, he's chasing three thousand. You got everybody on their feet. That's what the fans want to see. Like you're the Yankees. You already have a long ball hitting team that can't hit a home run to save their lives. I guess so. There's that. But I don't know. I guess I just feel like I would have, if I was in that situation, I would have said pitch to him, see what happens. But I mean. Like I said, it's early on in the season, so I don't know why you're going too crazy about it and why you're getting all your pains in a twist when you're trying to win the game when it's just like you're seven and four overall right now. You got eighty more games to play. Yeah, the thing that it is, and I told some, I know that some of my buddies were talking about this um, before our run actually this morning. If this would have been an occurrence in game two, we would not have this conversation. Right, no, he, yeah. the last game of the series, the final at bat he's going against against the Yankees, which were also the franchise that told him in the draft process that if he made it to the major leagues, it'd be as a pitcher. Right, that started the whole beef of this thing with the Yankees altogether, and the fact that it came in the situation of, all right, here it comes, right, two on, chance to extend the lead, pretty much bury the Yankees in the bottom of the eighth. And then you had that situation arise, and they immediately gave him the four fingers. I can understand it, that. I can understand Boone's point of view, and EJ Hinch even confirmed that in the post game press conference. That yeah, I had no doubt he was going to walk him. 
in that situation. I mean, you'd load the bases and you'd, you'd give a chance for your lefty to get out a lefty reliever. But even upon further digging, I noticed when you looked at the statistics, like that also wasn't the best decision either because Austin Meadows had been hitting, I believe the number was 375 against lefty relievers going into that game with an OPS above 870. And you wanted to pitch to him with the lefty on lefty compared to Miguel Cabrera that was 0 for 3. I'm not commending that that this was a this was all just a a big get back at you which Boone did not help his case when he said that thing in the press conference about yeah, he got me in 2003. So now we're even. It's like, "What? You're living 20 years ago? What?" What do you mean? What do, what does that have to do with this? Like, mm-hmm. you know what I it's just crazy to me. This whole thing is going to be blown up and obviously I love that Miguel Cabrera is not making a big deal about this. He's yeah. just he was like even how, he was like even how, telling yeah. kids don't come to my don't skip school to come to my games because that's more important. That's just that's just the humble guy he is. And yeah. that's what really Detroit just loves about him and I loved about him growing cool up thing, was how cool he was, as humble as he was as well. The cool thing too is like when you saw or like when he kinda came home from that and like the fans were like kinda getting up in arms about it, like he like put his hands up and he's like, Hey, calm down a little bit. Like we're yeah. still like we're winning. We're good. Yeah. Like this is like the the main goal. Like, yeah, the, I guess like as a fan, if I paid like money to go see him to go like for the possibility of him getting three thousand, it would be sick. Yeah, they won too, which is a good thing. But like I thought I'd be mad, but then also it's just like if he tells me, hey, don't worry about it, then, like, you can't really get mad because that's the guy who it's happening to, you know. <laughs> yeah, sir, yeah, sir, I'm not coming to the game then. I'm I'm going to listen to you. And I think, I mean, I can be, I can relate somewhat in this situation. The fans at Comerica Park were also, you guys are awesome. Just the fact that the that you had that so much support for them. Um, even getting the chance out there, you know, Yankees suck all across keep the that ballpark. Up. Keep that up. I'm not, I'm all for it. Just keep that up. Um, but I can kind of relate to this in the situation. I can feel where the fans are coming from because I went down last, last summer, um, when he was on the chase for 500 and when he was at 499 still, and it was one of the last home games before he ended up doing it in Kansas city, I believe, uh, he hit a ball down. I think it was like the, I want to say like the sixth inning and he was up to, he was up to bat. I think there's one on one out and he got plunked. Like square in the shoulder, like the front shoulder, just got plunked, and the whole like ballpark, because this was going to be the last time. Like it was, it might have even been like the seventh or the eighth, because they immediately pinch ran him. Because in that situation, they needed runs, so they subbed him out immediately. That's the last time he's gonna have a chance to break. It was the last game of the homestand, so everybody around the ballpark was just like, "No, oh, you guys suck." The the and it, at the time it was the Indians, of course. Uh, and they were like, "Ah, oh, the Cleveland, you guys suck. You you guys are just a the trash bit of baseball." And I'm just like, "Hold on, guys. Like, there's still a game going on." Yeah, I didn't get 500. Would I have loved to be in the position to say I was at the game where Miggy hit his 500? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, I would have. I would. Have, I had the pictures. I was literally preparing everything for it, but it didn't happen. Oh wow. Still a great baseball game, yeah, and that's what it comes down to. And we still got the win, and that's all that Miguel Cabrera, Cabrera cares about, and that's all that I would care about because at this moment of time, the Yankees can go shove it, and the Tigers are still winning baseball games. And by the way, that we're still in the position where we need to pick it up just a little bit and get some more wins here. I mean, we're fourth in the Central. I mean, yeah, we're 12 mm-hmm. games in, but a little bit of sense of urgency. It is it is going to come, but I but Miguel Cabrera is absolutely right. Got to win games. I mean, milestones are great, but we got to win games. And that's yeah. what's the most important thing. Yeah. True. I mean, that's the one thing is like we're what 5 and 7 right now. Something like that. So yeah. we're not like in the greatest situation for uh, you know, trying to I don't it's not even making a run yet because like we're still so early on in the season. But I think it's also just kind of making it so we can have a kind of a base point of how to base it off of yeah, 5 and 7. Like, cause if we get into, cause then that brings up the, the, the conversation is like, how deep is it? How deep is too deep of a hole at the beginning of the season to dig yourself out of? Right. Cause you don't want to get too far down like 10 or 15 games, um, you know, behind 500. So that way, like you're just kind of on, on your heels the whole season and you're just trying to get back to that point and kind of like back when, when was it like 2010 or 2011 or something when we like had to like win was it five or six games in a row at the end of the season to get back to 500 to get into that wild card spot 
like that's the one thing that you don't really want near the end of the season is like just kind of have the ultimatum. But then, I mean, you got like the Rockies who are one of the hottest teams in baseball right now. You got the Twins coming up who are near the lower part of the AL Central with us. And then you got the Dodgers who are ridiculous coming up in the Pirates. So we got a pretty tough schedule these next couple of weeks, these next, what, 20 games or so. So it's not going to be the easiest thing to do. But I think if we just play pretty solid, try to go 500 through this and stay stay in a spot where we're only two to three games behind 500 uh, up until like kind of when the crunch time happens is going to be good. But you just got to have that on the back of your mind. It's just don't get too far behind where it's going to have to be too much of a hole to dig yourself out of where you're just clawing for anything. Yeah, absolutely. I think our fan base has done a great job of highlighting moments in this season. Like there's been a lot of great, like great moments already overall this season. I mean, Torque is his game winning home run Torque bomb. a couple day, a couple games ago. Um, I mean, Javi, his flashing his glove in the first, in literally the first inning in a Tigers uniform. Uh, his home run to lead us to victory a, a little bit longer ago. Like, there's been great times where we've encapsulated moments, but there's been a little bit too much emphasis on the moments. And I think that comes definitely with the hype of this season as a whole going in because like, we knew this team was going to be good. And whatever the Vegas put us at, at like 70 wins or whatever, they can't, they obviously don't pay enough attention. But the, the biggest thing, like, we have to be a little bit more empathetic on need wins Moments are great. Don't get me wrong. Moments are awesome. But moments and wins, now that is what makes it even better. And we've had those great moments and wins happen before, but it only happens once a series, right? And that's the the bottom line with what A.J. Hinch has said so far this season, what a lot of the players have said this season. It's like, yeah, it's great, but we're not winning enough games. And they know that. Like, there's been different franchises in different situations that has literally been in the same boat and have let that slide, and they end up winning 65 to 70 games. And that's not going to cut it in eighty two in a 162-game season, right? you got to go 81 and 81 at least to get yourself in a, a little bit of a position. Obviously, you'd want more than that, and I think the Tigers are capable of that. Yeah. But, I mean, there is one positive that came out, especially from this game, that was outside of the walk-off and made Michael Pineda look pretty solid. Uh, in five innings of work, I believe, only allowed three hits, no earned runs. He looked pretty solid. Um, seeing him in a Tigers uniform for the first time. Um, this staff is going to be really good. We're going to see Bo later in making his Major League debut, so that's going to be really sweet um, to see him. I think he's going to be pitching uh, tomorrow on Saturday um, against the Rockies. So looking forward to seeing a lot of these young guys, um, the pitching staff, really step it up and start getting start getting back to their true stuff. Because, I mean, Mize, Manning, those guys looked those guys looked all right, but we had seen them in better overall to, compared to what they've started this season with. And we because we know Mize, Scoob, uh, Manning, as I mentioned, uh, we can we know we can see a lot of great pitching from them. We saw it last year, but right now we, they're off to a little bit of a slow start, and we're going to need that moving forward, especially like you mentioned, Joe, against some really good offensive teams so far this season, especially like the team we're going to be facing in the Colorado Rockies next. Season. Exactly. I mean, Chris Bryant too, kind of, kind of solid this year. Oh he's yeah, on the Rockies. Yeah, he's gonna, he's a big proponent on my fantasy team. Let me that tell you, that is true. That, that is, is true. true. I, now maybe not big enough of a proponent, Brandon. Oh, I am, beat, I am beating you oh, right now. That is true. So, I am beating you. A little bit of backstory here, um, with um fantasy baseball. Me and Joe have gotten ourselves involved in a a little bit of a, a competitive league, and we might be playing each other this week. Um, and actually, it's actually a league compiled completely of every of all Everybody athletic every, staff members yeah. that have been on the show. So Sean Sneed, Kyle Osaski, Travis Hicks, Harrison Watt, myself and Joe all in this league together. And I will tell you what, right now I'm I'm sitting in first in the standings, but I will admit Joe's got me very well um, beaten right now halfway through this week. Um, but I will say this, my pitching staff hasn't had great performances. I was unfortunately... Uh, given the illustrious honor of basically having to pick Garrett Cole so far, and that has not been going well. But I mean, my Hate to see secondary it. picks of uh, like Carlos Rondon and Max Scherzer have definitely helped my cause for sure. But uh, I do have Chris Bryant on my team, so a little bit torn going to the series. But I also have Torque, so bombs. I'm going to be hitting some bombs hopefully this week uh, against Rockies. I'm going to probably insert him into my lineup. I'm confident. Um, but Joe, I respect it. Can you just not have Francisco Lindor on your team? 
Can dude, you just cut him? Lindor has been raking it right now, dude. <laughs> Can he you has just been cut smoking. Him, please? I'll say I'll tell you what, la- I saw a graphic. Last last year is to get to four home runs, he was like game forty or something. Only like game fourteen that he's uh, at four bombs on the yeah. season. So he's really improved at the plate. That's a that's a gem on my team right there. I got Abreg too, who eh, he's all right. He's not doing super great this year. I got Cody Ballinger as well, who's doing pretty solid. Tatis is injured right now, so I don't. I have him kind of like in the utility spot, which is not like the best spot. I'm probably gonna try to find somebody who ca- I can fill the gap because I definitely do want him when he gets back. Uh, I got some other good guys. I got Anthony Rizzo too, who I was kind of torn, uh, especially with the Yankees game. But I guess I got a pretty solid team. Not gonna lie. Yeah, I I feel like I have a really solid staff overall. I got Scherzer, Rondon. Uh, I picked up Adam Wainwright, I think, actually, is one of my last picks right now, and he's in top 20, and he's one of my leading scorers this week. Uh, but, yeah, Garrett Cole getting negative one point. What the heck? What are we doing here right now? That's just that's just not going to cut it. I know he was been kind of banged up in the, the series, but that's a good thing because it was against Detroit. Uh, Charlie Morton also underperformed as well. Uh, but I mean, I have some pre. I'm, I mean, I have some pretty solid pieces. They're all just really explosive one game and then just kind of dormant the next. Like Machado is probably my by far best player. Uh, but then I have guys like I picked up like late round sleepers of like Charlie Blackman and uh, Randy Rose Arena, and uh, I have Pete Alonso as well. It's been kind of slow so far, Bo Bichette, but I think I got a pretty solid team overall. Um, mm-hmm. But. You just need a little bit more consistency. That's the bottom line that I need with my team, and I think that that could be um, achieved possibly by making some moves coming up on the waiver wire. I already made one uh, adding Carlos Carrasco, and that benefited me well last night um, to replace a struggling, str- <laughs> yeah, just struggling Drew Rasmussen so far. So um, I definitely see that going forward as potentially a move that might benefit but I gotta be Joe first, and that's that that's the problem. Are you gonna be able to do that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't if know. my if my pitching kind of building up a little bit of a, li- I mean, I'm only seventy or sixty six points in front of you. So. Yeah, I need a big I need a big outing from Syndergaard against the Orioles coming up on yeah. Friday. That's or Saturday. That's really what I need. And I think I don't have anybody else in my rotation coming up because I the bulk really of your points. Um, comes from guys having huge offensive like monster games, um, like especially like Pete Alonso for example. For me, had like a 16 point game um, earlier, uh, I believe, or no, 13 point game uh, in this matchup against the the Diamondbacks. We had a home a two run home run and had two runs, and I think he had also another another base hit. Um, but like the biggest thing I think kind of transition I guess to fantasy baseball is I feel like you definitely need. One, you need the attention because you got to check your lineup like every day, pretty much, um, mm-hmm. to try to fill it and maximize it because it's not necessarily like football where it's one game a week. Like you're you're checking it every day. Like you have to make sure you have guys in your lineup every day. You have to check injuries. You got to check lineups because even though it's a star player, it doesn't mean he's going to play every week or yeah. er, er, every day, I should say. So that's definitely one thing. But uh, I think a big thing too is like you have to be able to get the consistent guys as well as. Being able to still have, because there's one thing to have consistency, having guys hit, get two, three, four points every game, you know, obviously go like one for four, maybe have a run scored, uh, maybe a couple, maybe an RBI every couple of games or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's another thing when you have guys like Joe has Lindor that he had what, like a home run, like four or five RBIs or something, something whatever it was like later that, yeah. last or this week where he can get put up a 20 spot, um, basically scoring pitcher. Like literally scoring as a pitcher for one game, and then you still have that consistency. That's where you really, that's where mm-hmm. you really can set yourself apart, especially in the format that we are in. But I'll say it right here: I think I can win the chip. I'm straight up gonna say it. I'm not gonna say that I'm gonna win the chip. I'm gonna say that I can. I think with my team, I can win a chip. Yeah. We'll just have to see. The I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to make some moves a little bit. I think to get some more high performance pitchers. I think because some of them are a little bit low. Like I have like Brandon Woodruff, who had lately, like these past two weeks, not performing super well, and kind of getting rid of some of these other like lower name starting pitchers, so that way I can get a few more points on the board. Yeah, but we'll see. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Is it gonna be me and you for the chip? Maybe. Well, actually. I'd can it? I'm not sure with with the way that the the potential playoff bracket is I'm not set sure. up because I don't sure. I don't know if it's seated by because I think if you look at like the pl- projected I'm playing Kyle and then you're playing Sean so we could meet 
but even though because obviously we're still we're in the same division so it kind of kind of makes it a little uh like it like it always feels like in fantasy there's like like obviously the nfl the nba mlb there's conference and yeah. division emphasis like obviously nfc teams can't play each other in the super bowl where i always thought that's how it was in fantasy but it really isn't yeah you just kind of have those to have like the the pretty much like the tiebreaker like if you have two teams or whatever if one if you have th- four teams from one division but you only have one from the other you have to take the other one obviously so but i think it'll be interesting i'm really looking forward to seeing how baseball season goes together um i also saw this one thing on Twitter, I didn't know this was a thing. So I was, or I was, if it was on Twitter or it was on uh, Instagram when I was surfing around, which also plug, go follow us at the MBSP on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, but there's actually this thing I found um, for umpiring. There's there's an account called Umpire Scorecards. It has two hundred thousand followers, by the way. Really Dang. well known. It's I like a fantasy league for umpires no it's even better it's basically an evaluation scorecard so this whoever runs this account or whatever um they're they basically have these scorecards made up and uh obviously um i wish i could put it on the screen if we had a video show which also you should comment below if we should have a, a video show or not coming up in what the is summer it called? Uh, so it's called umpire scorecards it's at ump scorecards is the twitter handle and it um. has if you scroll through it Every single umpire that is like calling a game, they have an evaluation tool that you can have. You can see their accuracy, how correctly they called pitches, the fa- the favor, which is very interesting, on based on the impact of the calls, how much it f- could favor one team over another, which is extremely interesting to me. As well as they have like a bunch, like they actually have a zone made up. Of what their estimated zone it's is on based Twitter on the call. It is on Twitter. Oh, that's why I try to look it up on Instagram. Oh, it's not on Instagram. Darn. No. So if you have Twitter, go find it at Ump Scorecards. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand my phone to Joe here so he can see it. Oh um, shoot! Man. But they have all of these these umpire scorecards, and I just saw this the other day. And I thought it was super interesting. I think it's really cool because not only can the umpires use that as a tool, uh, but you can see like you can see all this information. And be able to determine based off of that, like the favor thing was just insane to me. Like I like you don't want to like go out there and be like, yeah, one umpire was favoring a team over another. But like there was one where Laz Diaz, for example, um, it was a Wednesday game. It was eleven to one. The Guardians smashed the Sox, which was really surprising to me. But the overall favor of like the the calls were actually favored towards the White Sox. Like, hmm. so it's really weird just to see all these numbers and stuff. It's just extremely intriguing to Dang, me. he has to do to a lot of work this. for this, for this but, one guy. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm wondering, if he's got a team of this. But That's I, like, uh, have you seen, did you see in the minors they were, like, doing the uh, electronic umpires? Yes, I did see that. That one video. Like, mm-hmm. there's, uh, I think the um, the uh, the pitch was, like, right down the middle, but the uh, catcher was lined up a little bit outside, and it was the pitch was down the middle, but he kind of had to reach across and like move a lot. Yeah, and he if set it up was inside. yeah, yeah, and if it was a like up to the umpire's judgment, he probably would have called the ball because the ump or the catcher had to move around a lot. But it was called a strike because it was a true strike. Yeah, right. So like, I think that's the one thing that's gonna be really. That's the cool thing about minor leagues is like we're trying out things that like MLB would never do. Yeah, and I think when I you're able cool. to kind of workshop it a little bit and improve it, that's gonna be the cool thing because I'm not like. What's your th- what is your thoughts on like electronic umpires? Like, are you more of kind of an old head where you kind of want to see that stay in the game, or you? Yeah, wanna... I kind of I I'm a little bit more old headish with that. I think that there's sh- what I would personally like because I think like with the the way that a game flows, having like a actual figured person there to control it is going to be yeah. needed. And I think it's important for like close calls. Yeah, yeah, stuff. absolutely. But I think that that's a certainly like a good idea to have like. You know, like, cause like we, that can, like that can be a constant is like the strike zone. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, Like we can have an ability to say like, Hey, like people like this that make the umpire scorecards that have this, apparently these tools to show you where the ball is in the zone based off of where, now, I don't know if it's just a graphic they put together, if they actually have like censored analytical data to be able to track where a pitch is. But we have that already with StatCast, right? We have, we have those electronic strike zones where we can have something that says like, uh, if in case need be, you can be like, oh, I'm not sure that ball was really close. And even if it's a sensor in your pocket as the umpire, and then they can have that additional call made up. Because there's like, because obviously we don't care about 
we call all of the all the big calls that we care about are the ones that are questionable, right? Yeah. The ones on the edge of the zone, inside out part of the plate, top bottom. Like edges is the only thing that matters that we're arguing about really in the game of baseball when it comes to strikes and balls. Now, obviously, if there's somebody that is not calling those, then or anything inside the box, that tells a different story. Yeah. But in the reality of it is. When you have that, those tools available, and I think it's a great idea to make it from bottom level minor up to top, kind of you kind of go from the experiment off the bottom part of the league, and then you can move it up if it succeeds. Because if it if you use it in single A, no harm no foul, right? Or rookie league or whatever. Because yeah, like, these guys are still trying, like they're they're still trying to get to the major leagues as a whole, and it's not going to be the same impact as Triple A. Right, because yeah. you don't have you don't have guys potentially going back and forth there. If you're in single A, you're trying to you're you're not going to make. If you're, you're in single like, A, you're not you're getting to the major league unless you're unless you're a Torkelson or like a guy who has like a crazy amount of hype when he's going into single A, and like you know he's probably going to move up really fast. Sure, then like it's not going to be a big deal because a lot of those guys, especially like if you look at the, like the White Caps, like the Tigers, like single A team that's in Grand Rapids, like. Yep. There's guys that have been there for four or five years. Yeah. So, like, when you have those guys who are probably going to stay there for a while and are going to be there, like, it's not that big a deal when you're, like, kind of experimenting because it's not going to affect them super much. But I get what you're saying, especially with, like, AAA. Like, you have guys bouncing back and forth. Like, you don't really want to mess up anything so that way, like, they kind of it, – it could negatively affect their, you know, statistics that can kind of make it so that way they get sent down. Yeah, yeah, It's low risk when you do it at single double A. And low then risk, you, high reward, and then if, honestly. And then if you figure out that, hey, yeah, this is working – then you move it up to double A. Then if they like it, then you go to triple A. Then you do. Then it goes to the major leagues. I don't like the fact that we're trying stuff at triple and double A because of your, your, your what you mentioned, that I crossover. A, low A and high A is like the perfect spot. Yes, exactly. Because that's that's not like the baseball is good. Yeah. I mean, did, we're going to see the Torkelsons. We're going to see those guys move up like Dylan Dingler and uh, eventually – um, Parker Meadows will move up, I think, by the end of the season for sure. Uh, from that, from the uh, single A to double, but you you have those guys. It's not necessarily the same baseball as much as it is entertainment. Yeah, right. You know what I mean. You're not necessarily going there to see. Oh my gosh, Miguel Cabrera, right in in the major leagues. Oh my gosh, Riley Green's playing for the Mud Hens, right? Like you're not looking. Like obviously Torkelson was a different story, right? That's yeah. that's once in a lifetime when you get a number one pick. But you when you go there. It's it's for the experience. You're more there just to experience a ball game. Yeah, it's not right? going to be the full aspect of a major league game. Instead, it's more entertainment wise as opposed to the game itself. Not necessarily saying that it's completely an entertainment scheme. That's not even close to what I'm saying. But there's more emphasis on the entertainment in those lower levels. Can can you can consider like uh, the what is it the team that goes uh, viral the Savannah Bananas or whatever yeah. where they're like playing in skirts and stilts and like these these really yeah. weird it's more, like, of a, it's more of a show yeah rather than exactly anything. that's exactly my point so and you can like, use those you see levels espe- to do those especially stuff. like single and like stuff like that you see like the in between innings like events and stuff like yeah. the games that they play with a crowd dizzy bat race like, yeah dizzy yes. bat race running around Human the bases sandwich. doing that type of stuff you yes. only see that at the major leagues because. You're not really allowed to, right? right? So like, that's there's the, so much rules and regulations. Yeah. So I think that's the good thing about it. I th- I think it's good for baseball, honestly, because it's gonna kind of take away the, the, like, chance or like variability of what is called a ball and a strike. Because these umpires are incredibly good. They have like really great consistency. It's just like that one time that they call a ball for a stri- or a ball for a strike or a strike for a ball could really alter a game and especially when that happens later on like postseason wise and you see those bad calls umpires are getting flamed so i think if they kind of if this goes well for the single a and kind of move this way up i would i wouldn't really be appalled to see this in in the majors yeah i think it's what i would per- preferably like if i were to throw out an idea that i would really like you still have you still have an umpire but if there is a questionable call that he's not sure of he can he can wait yeah. to get that like data within that two second span because obviously if you're calling a ball like because you're like obviously the biggest thing that I've learned from umpires is you don't call from the zone directly you you wait from the zone and then you call it like you're not necessarily because I I've seen umpires and I I think I was talking to you, to you about this Joe about the Northwood um the the umpire at the Northwood game he was calling so fast like it was yeah. Like directly in the zone, because it's not where the catcher catches it. That's that's the that's the one A or what yeah, it where, should be. Yeah, because it's where the ball travels from the front part of the plate to the back part of the plate. Yeah, but 
you're not necessarily supposed to call it that way because, I mean, if you're doing that, you're registering too early, right? Because your brain only has certain amount of time to react. It's milliseconds, right? So why would you, if you're calling it while it's in the zone, while the ball's in the zone, that means you registered it before it's in the zone, which isn't necessarily the way you're supposed to be calling it, right? You're supposed yeah. to wait for it to go through the zone and then call it after it hits the mitt. But if you have a question about it, you have somebody with a sensor that can read it and re relay the information within two seconds, then it's still going to be the same mm -hmm. amount of flow. And we have the technology to do that. I'm sure they've experimented, yeah. experimented I mean, with robot, that. And like, robots can't make calls out in the field yet. Yes, like, that's exactly. Like, and we'll please, and, those. Yeah, and please don't, like, professional level is one thing because, like, obviously this is what their profession is. They're paid to get these calls, right, and stuff. Yeah. But just because your team loses doesn't mean it's the umpire's fault. I understand like there's certain circumstances where impactful calls can change the game or whatever. I guess this more relates to like sometimes to little kids is, leagues, you know, not. like the, what is it? Like they always have the, the signs up and I, I love that so, the fact yeah, that they your, did that. Your kid's not getting scouted today. Yeah, take yeah, a chill yeah. pill. Yeah. There's no brewer scouts today. So please don't play like your kids going to the major leagues or whatever. These umpires are volunteers. Um, these coaches are simply parents. Like, this is not World Series Game Seven. Please just chill yeah. out on all the umpire. What's the uh, what's the craziest reactions. what's the craziest like parent umpire experience you ever have to been through? Oh jeez, there's been a couple growing up where I, I I was having some I was having some fits with some, but I I have never really, I've never like been a like a, a hothead of like getting ejected from yeah. a game or something like that. Like I've I've usually just kind of kept it to myself if I have a problem with something. There was one time. And actually, it wasn't really like growing up. It was in high school, actually. We were playing against Grant, and this umpire would not, he would not get away from the high pitches. Like, and I, don't oh, get me wrong. Calling, he was calling I love high pitch. He was calling neck high. I'm what? like, you can't do that. Like, there was a single at bat where it was like the first at bat I had, ball up about just above the buttons on a, on a uniform top, just about on the bottom side of the neck. And he rang up two of them on me directly. And I watched both of them because it's not a strike. And I'm like, are those, I was like, are those high? And he's like, nope, those are in the zone. I'm like, um, I don't sure? know what zone you're talking about, but okay. And the next pitch, he rang me up on the knees. And I was in the outside part on the knees. And I was like, all right, cool. So the next day, B, I go up. And they threw one up high, didn't call it. And I was like, oh, okay. He must have just had a bad AB with me. I don't care. And I, I we got it to one, two or whatever. One comes up about the same height, rings me up. And I'm just, and I literally, I literally let out like the words, are you kidding me? As I went to the dugout, I was so upset. I didn't get like called up or talked about anything. Yeah. But like everybody kind of paid attention because I was, I'm not the one that complains verbally about the umpires. Like I obviously yeah. would be like, yeah, that one would like, seem a little low or whatever, but I've never gotten visibly frustrated. And yeah, that was one of the worst like called games. I think we've had, I had in high school overall. Cause I think there was like a total of like 17 strikeouts that game. And it was only like, and there was only like I think a combined eight runs, like it was like five to three or something. Yeah. And it was like literally after the game, um, both yeah, both coaches were like, yeah, that umpire sucked. Way to way to push through it, guys, because that was yeah. awful. So it was just uh, that was probably one of the worst experiences I had, where I actually like was so agitated I had to react because I've usually been pretty good about being able to control myself a little bit. Um, there was earlier parts in my career where I did not, and I will admit <laughs> that. Um, but that was more of me like striking out, like. I swing and miss. I'm like, God, I suck. I knew that was a curveball. What am I doing? Like, I suck. But not necessarily, like, actually having the total reaction of, like, yeah, this is wrong, and I can't do anything about it. That was bad. Yeah. It's more of, like, oh, yeah, that sucked. I should have been able to hit that ball. Like, I swung True. and missed. That's on me. Where it's, like, yeah, I know I, I shouldn't be hitting these pitches, but they're calling strikes, and I can't do anything about it. That was a different one. Yeah. There's so one that was time, probably my experience. There's one time freshman year, we were playing Morley, and uh, this one catcher uh, would always throw the ball back really hard. Like, it, like basically, like he was throwing it on the second, but he was just throwing it to the pitcher. Yep. And there's one time where I was on third, and he threw it, and he overthrew it to the pitcher and went to the outfield, and I scored. So then we went up by, like, one. And then it happened, like, two other times other than that. And then the coach, like, turned to him or, like, called time and just, like, talked to him. He's like, you got to stop doing that. And he was, like, yelling at him and stuff. And then he just, like, took off all of his gear, threw it down. He's like, all right, I quit. 
And I'm just like, dang, dude, like, it's <laughs> a pretty easy fix. Like, wow. you don't have to, like, quit or anything. So he's packing up his stuff, and, like, his, the kid, the catcher's parent comes, like, onto the field and is, like, yelling at the, the like, the dad or whatever. It's not an umpire story, but it's still a crazy story regardless. Gee, yeah. He's yelling at the coach. And, like, they're, like, in a yelling match back and forth saying, like, your kid's out of line or whatever. And he's like, you can't talk to my kid about, like, like that. And they end up going. They, like, do a burnout in the parking lot to, like, make sure everybody <laughs> knows that they're just getting angry or whatever. And, like, I, like, was on, I think the fourth. He did it four times. And the fourth time he did it, I was on first and I got the second. And I was, like, talking to your shorts. I was like, this happened, like, often at your practices or something like, like you guys get like yelled at he's like no that kid just like doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> and then uh, after that like the um the coach was like just fuming and then like like they were just like on edge the whole time and then like after every bad call then he was like yelling at the umpires and stuff and the, co- the coach got thrown out like the second game was funny wow that is a good story there's been some good ones uh growing up in little league that have been my grandpa got kicked out of a game once really yeah he was standing behind he was chirping the umpire (laughs) it was an old guy though so it wasn't a kid but it was like an old guy that was umpiring and he's like dude you suck (laughs) like he is like just straight up like you're the worst umpire and he turned he's like all right you're out of here and he's like no and then like he like got in a yelling match with the guy i was like grandpa just leave please just like so that's I'll glorious go, like we'll go out to eat or something after this but just leave like don't don't make this a bigger deal than it has to be oh my goodness yeah i, I don't think i've had any like thrown out stories my dad was my coach growing up Same. Uh, but he never he was always pretty he was pretty good about keeping his composure with some bad umpires but um there was also there was another volunteer uh coach that was another dad he would be on it would be kind of cool because my dad would play good cop and then my other friend's dad would be a bad cop. So he'd be the one chirping at him. It's like, nah, nah, nah. and if he got thrown out, my, my dad just the best, take over. Uh, He's like, yep, we're cool. The best part about being catcher is like, you get to talk to the umpires and stuff. And like, also like my dad knew like every umpire. I don't know how, but they always knew me. And like, every time that like somebody on my team would like begin chip or it'd be like, joke, and you like, take care of this or whatever. So <laughs> I don't have to throw this kid out. And I'm That's like, nice. right, I got you. Yes. Yeah. Shout that out is... to Bill. Bill is my favorite umpire. Oh yeah, I think I know what. I you think know which I know one he is? He was like a tall, like six. He was like yes, six three, six yes, four. Yes, I know you're talking mustache. about. Mustache. Yeah. He's got white hair. He's a little bit heavier set yes, guy. I know Dude, who you're talking Bill about. Bill is such a good guy. Yep. Him and um Kevin Courtney, who I've actually Dude, worked love with in Kev. basketball. Love Kev is Kev. awesome. Uh, and he he appreciates the game itself. You as ever have with the athletes? You ever have the tall guy with the glasses? Tall skinny guy with the glasses? Um, I want to. That sounds familiar. I, I'm not picturing him off the top of my head. I kind of forgot about the bad ones, to be honest. He wasn't. He wasn't bad. He wasn't out. the best either. But there was one time where I was like catching, and we had like a bunch of mayflies around us, like going after our eyes. And uh, he like he was like turning. He's like, dude, like these things are like kamikaze pies are going for your eyes every time. Oh, and goodness. I'm just like, dude, what the heck? <laughs> what did you say? I was like, what? What? <laughs> What do you mean by that? Oh my gosh! That? That's, and he is like saying that. I was like, dude, that's off the rails. I was like, what, <laughs> what in the I world? Like, I forget his name, but yeah. Oh Kevin, my goodness, Kevin and Bill. Kevin, and what Bill. guys? I do know those two, and those two were fantastic. I actually got to work Kevin, uh, work with Kevin in basketball for uh, younger kids basketball this winter to do some some uh, some part time uh, refereeing. So that was really fun, Sick. and it really gets you that being a, being an umpire and being a referee, an official really opens up your world to like, yeah, I can understand. Like there's a lot of times they just tough calls and these guys do a much better job than I could. So I, I shouldn't be like saying all these stuff like you guys suck or whatever. Like I do a better job and then you actually do it and you're like, yeah, this is harder. This is really a lot harder than it actually is. So thank you to all the umpires that make it possible. We need more of them. I know I wrote a piece in the, uh, the torch that explains all that. So you can read that online at fsutorch.com as well as Joe's pieces as well. Kids are trash, man. That's why nobody wants to umpire anymore. Yeah, I guess I guess that's what it is. Too many entitled children in this world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think they're is, going to the league. That is That is partially true. So if you don't make it to the league, that's okay. Because you can be a co-host Respect the on the umpires. <laughs> One of these days, we're not going to have any umpires left because they don't want to deal with the parents and the kids anymore. That is true. So, trace your umpires with respect. That's true. Let's keep sports going. And let's keep having fun so that we can make good content as well. Exactly. Thank you guys for tuning into this 
very conversational episode. Yeah, Great more stuff. of a conversation type episode. Good today. storytelling there. If you want more storytelling, let us know on our episodes. We're always looking for your guys' feedback. And also on Spotify, you can hit up the questions at the bottom of the episode description. Questions, um, reviews, anything. Yeah, so you can leave anything. Leave a five star review. It'll make us feel very good about ourselves. Exactly. Or leave us a four star, three star. Hey. We like the feedback, we won't, we and we want to make our show. About what you give us. Yeah, we want to make our show better for you. Guess we'll guys. find out who you are. And <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Blackmail. I was in a retaliation procedure that I just learned in my human resources class. <laughs> that you're not supposed to do. I do know what it is, and I do know how to do it. I probably shouldn't have said that, as I'm probably going to the workforce. But <laughs> we'll just yeah, we'll just delete that anyway. Um, but yeah, great show. Great and until show. next time, take care, everybody.